chapter 67 will begin on 1469. This chapter will go over male patients with reproductive problems, benign prostate hyperplasia. This is just an enlargement of the prostate gland. Some signs and symptoms you will have, you may have hematuria with BPH, the enlarged prostate gland compresses your urethra, which will back or block the flow of urine. Some signs and symptoms the patient might present with, they might have urgency, frequency, they have nocturia where they have to get up at night and go to the bathroom, or they have an overflow of urinary incontinence. Male reproductive disorder, physical assessments, recognize the cues. Of course, you always wanna do the health history, evaluate the urinary function and sift, sift symptoms such as hesitancy, straining, and any sexual dysfunction. Any symptoms of enlarged prostate, do they have any medication that might affect their sexual function or illness? Have they had a digital rectal exam? And for men over 40 to assess the prostate gland for size and the shape of it and other abnormalities that might indicate cancer or BPH. Testicular exam, scrotum is palpated for nodules, masses or inflammation. Penis is inspected for ulcerations, nodules, or discharge. Teach the patient techniques so he can perform self-exams at home, just like a woman would do self-breast exams. After the exam, the prostate gland is palpated and massaged to obtain fluid to rule out prostatitis, which occurs a lot with BPH. If there's an infection, the patient is placed on a broad spectrum antibiotics to prevent the spread of infection. Diagnostic exams, the prostate gland produces a substance known as prostate-specific antigen, they call it PSA, and it is measured in the blood and an increased level may indicate BPH, cancer, or infection. It's recommended yearly for men at high risk. The normal level is less than 2.5, and some numbers are higher in the elderly population. If the PSA is normal, schedule the patient for a digital rectal examination then. And this is just a review of your anatomy in case you forgot. Um, the male reproductive system. So this just shows the prostate gland and their organs. Assessment, recognize cues. On the urinary pattern, you wanna check and, and ask them, do they have frequency, nocturia, uh, other symptoms that might report to bladder neck obstruction? Um, do they have he hesitancy? intermittent? Um, do they have blood in their urine? Laboratory assessment, if you look on page 1473. All right, your analysis and culture <clears throat> is done to see if UTI is present, a transabdominal ultrasound or prostate ultrasound may be done, they might even do tissue biopsies or a cystoscope to see inside the bladder, neck, and urethra if the male starts complaining of different signs and symptoms. The ultrasound, transrectal ultrasound, a probe is inserted into the rectum to detect non-palpable prostate cancer and also used for staging cancer. And we'll go over this when we get to our cancer lecture, but staging is numbered from one to five. One looks like normal cell and five has no resemblance at all. All right, look on page 1474. This goes over drug therapy. 
All right, five alpha reductase inhibitors. The first one is finasteride. This is Proscar or Dutesteride. This is your Avidart. These drugs are given by mouth and they lower the dihydrotestosterone, DHT. By decreasing DHT levels, this can shrink the prostate and prevent further growth. The patient must take for about six months before any change will occur. Women of childbearing age must not handle crushed or broken tablets due to possible absorption and potential risk to the male fetuses. Immediately wash contact area with soap and water if contact occurs. Inform patients of an increase in high-grade prostate cancer in men treated with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Inform patients that the volume of ejaculation may be decreased and that impotence or decreased libido may occur. Instruct patients to promptly report to their physicians any changes in breast such as lumps, pain, or nipple discharge, side effects or erectile dysfunction, and decreased sexual drive. All right, the second one is your alpha blocking agents. The prostate has alpha adrenergic receptors and it responds to the alpha blocking agents such as your Flomax, which is your Tamsulosin. They constrict the gland and this improves blood flow. Instruct patients to take these drugs with food. Cancel about possible symptoms of postural hypertension like dizziness. Caution patients about driving, operating machinery, or performing hazardous tasks while using these drugs. Another one is your docusolin, uh, Cardura, can be used for BPH and hypertension. Always assess the patient's blood pressure and monitor the patient about getting up too quick. Teach them to change position slowly and dangle first before they just hop up. These drugs relax smooth muscles in the prostate gland which will create less urinary resistance and improve the urinary flow. Make sure you keep doctor's appointments for labs because these drugs can cause liver failure. Some other drugs, you got Desmopressin, DDAVP, is a vasopressin and is used to lower doses with BPH to help prevent leakage at night. Then you got Cialis and Viagra should not be used by patients taking nitrates such as nitroglycerin because the combination may trigger an unsafe drop in blood pressure or should not be used with alpha blockers for treatment of BPH because the combo therapy has not been adequately studied and may increase the risk of lowering blood pressure. Doctors may order a combination of two of three drugs. Remember to tell the patients to check with their primary provider before starting any herbs or over-the-counter medication because of the potential of reaction of the two drugs together. Other non-surgical measurements. Frequent sexual intercourse will reduce prosthetic fluid buildup. Avoid drinking a large amount of fluid in a short amount of time and void as soon as you feel the urge. Avoid alcohol, diuretics, and caffeine. Surgical procedures, there are several of them. All right, the first one is a transurethral resection of your prostate, your TERP. So the transurethral resection is most common treatment. Instrument is inserted into the urethra to the prostate 
and the excess gland is removed with a electrical cutting loop, no incision, overnight hospital stay, rarely causes sexual dysfunction, will have a bladder irrigation post-op, and I will show you that a three-way Foley in class and explain that to you. Number two will be a suprapubic prostatectomy, removing the gland through an abdominal incision, and the incision is made into the bladder and gland is removed then. The third one is a retropubic prostatectomy. Abdominal incision is low and the gland is removed without entering the bladder. Peritoneal prostatectomy, removal of the gland through the perineum, high risk for infection and incontinence and rectal injury. The third one, this is a new one, the Holloman laser inoculation of the prostate uses a laser to remove the obstruction tissue and then pushes the tissue into the bladder for removal. Little blood loss, safe for patients that take blood thinners. This procedure will probably replace the TURP procedure in years to come. And this slide is just showing some of the different prostatectomy procedures there. And you can see the instruments that they use. Continuous bladder irrigation. If you look on 1477, this will show you um, what the bladder irrigation looks like. You can see it's a three-way Foley. One of the lumens go to the bladder irrigation that you hang up. The other one goes down to a drainage bag. And then you will see the other one that goes into your penis just like it is for a regular catheter. Urine is usually blood tinged after surgery with small clots and after catheter is removed. Um, <clears throat> look on page 1477, the critical rescue. Monitor the patient for the rare yet critical complication of Terp syndrome. If irrigation fluid is overabsorbed into the body, in addition to blood transfusions and bleeding, stress can be placed on the heart. Signs and symptoms include headache, dizziness, and shortness of breath. The patient is likely to also have elevated blood pressure, low pulse, and an altered level of consciousness. E.g. ECG findings include wide QRS, elevated ST, and inverted T waves. Notify the surgeon immediately as a patient will likely need intensive care while diuresing. If a patient complains of spasms, irrigate the catheter for clot obstruction per hospital protocol or doctor's order. May have to medicate with belladonna. This is an opium suppository for those spasms. Hemorrhage is a complication. You would want to report this ASAP. They may have clots, keep fluid regulated, never let the bag run dry. And this is just another picture of your bladder irrigation. You've got the normal saline uh, hanging, and then you see the actual drainage bag there. Post catheterization care, the patient may pass clots. You want to increase the fluid intake, instruct the patient that his sexual function should not be effective, but retrograde ejaculation can occur. Although you still reach sexual climax, you, you may ejaculate very little or no semen. This is called a dry orgasm. Retrograde ejaculation isn't harmful, but it can cause male infertility. And if you look on page 1478, this goes over two of the nursing alerts 
After a TERP, monitor the patient's urine output every two to four hours and vital signs, including pain assessment every four hours for the first post-operative day, or according to the agency, assess for post-operative bleeding. Patients who undergo TERP are at risk for severe bleeding or hemorrhage. Although rare, bleeding is most likely within the first 24 hours. Bladder spasms or movement may trigger fresh bleeding from previous controlled vessels. This bleeding may be arterial or venous, but venous bleeding is more common. So make sure that you read over those two nursing alerts. All right, then community-based care. Patients with a TERP are usually discharged the next day some with a catheter and some without, may have temporary, temporary loss of control with urination or dribbling. Usually this issue will resolve on its own. Prostate cancer. This is the most common invasive cancer among men in the United States. One of the slowest growing malignancy. Contributing factors are high in animal fat, diet, viruses, family history, vitamin D and E deficiencies, health promotion. At age 50, men should have an annual digital rectal exam, eat a healthy balanced diet, eat more fish due to the omega-3 fatty acids, eat more fruits and vegetables, and quit smoking. Prostate cancer assessment, recognize cues. You will want to check out their history, nutritional habits, problems urinating, drug history, pain during intercourse with ejaculation, weight loss, any STDs, digital rectal exam for men older than 40, a PSA, a screening tool for prostate cancer, but remember, always draw the PSA before a digital exam because it could increase the levels and you may get a false positive. You might have to do a biopsy and this will be necessary to confirm the suspected uh, prostate cancer. Sexual complications, sexual dysfunction is common and there are drugs that are efficient that can help with that problem. And on this slide, you can see where it's got the prostate capsule, the BPH tissue, your urethra, and then you can actually see the cancer there. I just wanted to show you that picture so you can kind of get a visual um, idea. Surgical management, minimally invasive surgery, or an open surgical technique for radical prostatectomy is the most often performed. Surgical management, the rectal prostatectomy is when they remove the prostate and the seminal vessels. Impotence is certain in five to 10% and impotence is certain in five to 10% of men have incontinence. Um, when they have a radical prostatectomy, no rectal temps or suppositories allowed. Bilateral orchinectomy, this is removal of both testicles, is a palliative treatment, not a curative. Postoperative care, teach about the type of surgery that is going to be performed. Um, drains and tubes and incisions turn, cough, and deep breathe, the IS, IV therapy, and then some complications that might arise, urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Post-operative care of a radical prostatectomy, your patient will have IV fluids, of course. They will have wound. They will have drains that you would need to teach them about just in case they have to go home. 
um, about getting up and ambulating, get out of that bed, up in the chair, walk in the hall to prevent embolus and prevent any pulmonary complications, deep breathing, coughing, the IS. Uh, these are very important. Early ambulation, monitor intake and output, laxatives and stool softeners. If they have spasms, you might want to give them antispasmodic uh, some, uh, meds. Indwelling urinary catheter, explain to the patient they will need a catheter for one to two days after the surgery, or if they have an open surgery, may have a catheter up to a week. They will be on antibiotics. They will be on analgesics for pain. Non-surgical management, radiation therapy. This is used if treated in early stages. May be curative treatment, five days a week for four to six weeks. Hormonal therapy used to control rather than cure this cancer was found to be an androgen, which is a male hormone dependent, so it is treated with estrogen to inhibit its growth. Chemotherapy, use chemo drugs when the cancer has spread, and then they might have complementary or alternative therapies. You'll want to increase food, foods that contain lycopene, such as tomatoes, watermelons, pink grapefruit, and increase their omega-3 fatty acids, which would be their fish. Testicular cancer incidence, although uncommon, this cancer is the most common malignancy in men from 20 to 35 years of age. With early detection by testicular self-exams and treatment with combination of chemo, testicular cancer can be cured. Classification of tumors, germinal, developed from the sperm producing cells of testes, non-germinal tumors develops from hormone producing tissue of the testicles. They rarely spread beyond the testicles. A small tumor metastasized and tend to be resistant to chemo and radiation. Secondary testicular cancer are those that metastasize to the testes from other organs. Lymphoma is the most common. Cancer can spread from the prostate, the lungs, the skin, kidneys, or other organs. Prognosis is poor and treatment depends on the type of cancer. Risk factors, several times greater than in men with undescended testes than in general population. Risk factors include family history, race, ethnicity. White males have higher rate than other males of other races and more than double the risk of Asian American men. Occupational hazards like mining, Oil or gas production, leather processing are risk factors. Assessment, clinical signs appear gradually with a mask or lump and general painless enlargement of the testes. May complain of heaviness in scrotum, inguinal area or lower abdominal area. Back pain, abdominal pain, weight loss, General weakness tends to metastasize early. Diagnostic test, monthly exam self, tumor markers. Tumor markers are just biochemical substances which, as the name suggests, are closely associated with carcinogens. These markers may be produced by cancer cells or by the host in response to the cancer. Uh, beta human chronionic gondotrophin HCG or alpha theta protein are tumor markers found to be elevated in blood tests. They will do ultrasounds, they'll do CTs or MRIs. 
Treatment depends on the type of cell and the extent of the disease. Organectomy, removal of one or both of the testes. They might do chemo, radiation, or a combination of both. Surgery is the main treatment. Erectile dysfunction. This is the inability to achieve or maintain an erection for sexual intercourse. 25 to 50 percent of men over 65 suffer from this condition. All right, there is what they call organic, is gradual deterioration of the of function caused by a disease process such as diabetes mellitus, vascular disease pituitary tumors, or testosterone deficiency. Or you've got functional, which is psychogenic. This can be caused by anxiety, fatigue, depression, or pressure to perform sexually. Assessment, medically need to make sure if, it, if the cause of ED is organic or not. Hormone testing is done. Labs are drawn for testosterone levels and sexual history you want to ask about. Assess medications that are being taken. Also assess the use of alcohol and drugs. All right, some interventions. You've got drug therapy. So you want to take the medication one hour before sexual activity. Avoid alcohol because it may impair your ability to erect. Avoid if taking nitrates because vasodilation effects can cause a profound hypotension and decrease blood flow to the vital organs. Um, some, some of the drugs is like Viagra, uh, Cialis, and some of the common side effects you might have is headaches, facial flushing, and stuffy nodes. So be real careful about taking nitrates when you're taking these medications. Uh, some other interventions, they, they've got what they call vacuum devices, which is a negative pressure device used to induce an erection. They got penile prosthesis. They have inflatable prosthetics or a semi-rigid rod. So it's just according to what you and your doctor discuss and what fits best in your life. All right, this slide here, these should be some uh, terms that you have seen before, especially in your physical assessment. Um, if you look on page 1489 and 1490, make sure that you know what these terms mean, because you might see these in a question, and if you don't understand the term, you might miss the question.